What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Real Bodybuilding Podcast. This is episode number 88, and I'm here with Mr. Shelby Starnes, coach of coaches. How are you, sir? I'm good. How are you? I'm good, man. Um, you know, you've been around for a long time, and you've slowly uh, accrued a really big following, and I thought it was important to have you on and um, kind of pick apart how you do things, because all your clients seem to come in really, really good shape. I just get good clients. <laughs> is that what it is? It's, a, it's not you at all. They, they just all happen to be shredded. That's the thing. I don't get any. I don't get any duds. I don't get any duds. Do you think there's something to that? Because honestly, like, let's say I let's say I have a coaching special and like a hundred people sign up. There's probably twenty genetically gifted people, but do you honestly think that just really genetically gifted people are coming your way, or do you handpick them? Um, I don't, I was, I was being facetious. I know, I know. Um, I, uh, I do get, I mean, I do get some, some people are genetically gifted, but then other people are just, you know, kind of middle of the pack. Mm -hmm. Um, but we figure out ways to get them to, to be their best, you know, maybe they, yeah. um, usually it's diet stuff. It's almost yeah. always diet stuff because everyone, everyone usually trains pretty hard, pretty intensely. And everybody's usually taking the same supplements and all that. Yeah. Um, it's usually, it's usually diet manipulation that gets them to the, to the next level, uh, in my experience. That's, uh, the impressive thing to me is when I see a coach that does not have a genetically gifted person and they're able to make them something special and, it seems from looking at your page and I'm, I'm going to show everybody your page now, just so they can kind of see what I'm talking about. Uh, this is Shelby's Instagram page, Shelby Starnes 100. If you're not following, following him now, follow him now. Um, these are some of your clients. Now you do predominantly train women, but they're all in really, really good condition. I notice. like you don't, I don't ever see anybody out of shape or out of proportion. Like they all have very, very nice physiques. So is this like they're coming to you and you're helping them achieve this or are they already kind of there? Like what, what is the bulk of your clientele? Um, well, the bulk of my Instagram page is my competitors. You know, I work okay. with a lot of, I work with a lot of non-competitors as well, but I don't, um, I don't really post those because Instagram is kind of my, you know, like my elite, my, my, yeah. my, 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 my elite work, my, uh, my, my, my competitors, a, a sure. lot of people think I, a lot of people think I don't work with competitors with non-competitors, but I do. Okay. But, um, yeah, I really, with, with the, I mean, I do, I do only coach competitive females. I stopped working with competitive males, uh, a handful of years ago. If someone, if someone comes to me, that is a, a male that wants to step on stage, I I'll suggest another coach. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to do that. I, I want to focus just on uh, female competitors and that's women's physique, women's bodybuilding um, figure. I don't do bikini. Um, I don't do wellness. I, I, I'm just the muscular, more muscular, more shreddy uh, divisions. Why, why have you uh, chosen not to train men? What is it? Is it just, is it just professional men or just men of all kinds? You just don't do that. I work, I work with men that are non-competitors. Okay. Um, but men that are stepping on stage, I just, over the years, I, I have come to enjoy uh, training females more than males that are stepping on stage. And uh, honestly, men that are stepping on stage, and this isn't, it's not all men, but the majority of men that are stepping on stage give me a headache. They want to, they're just, they're just annoying. Uh, they, they, they have egos. They have egos. They're always questioning things. They think they're getting too small. They think they're losing muscle. They're not full enough. They want to take more drugs, all mm -hmm. this shit that I just, it's very rare to get that from a, a woman. Um, yeah. But I wonder. Females, it's but like I, their pain tolerance is higher and they have a smaller ego. Yeah, but I wonder, doesn't I, I've trained a few women in my life and I notice that I get more of the personal stories with the women and I get less with the men. 
you know what I mean? Like my boyfriend did this and I was feeling bad and I ate some food and I don't seem to get as much of that with the men. The men seem to be more X's and O's, but you are right about what you said. They do seem to be like, uh, where I need more drugs. I'm not full enough. I'm not what this or that. So it's kind of like you're trading one for another. Do you notice that with the women at all, or you don't get those? Not so much, not so much because I mean, I, a lot of the women that I attract are high level competitors. Okay. Um, and so they've, you're not going to get much bullshit. Yeah. Um, you, you've already kind of weeded out like what you're saying. That sounds like maybe more common in someone that's maybe new. Yeah. Maybe isn't very advanced in competition and stuff like that. And once you, once you get to the, the higher levels of competition, you've kind of weeded out the people that are looking for excuses or, mm -hmm. you know, yeah, everyone, everyone that I work or the people that I work with that are professionals, you know, competing at a high level, they're like this. Yeah. I mean, they've got, they've got tunnel vision and they just want to get better. So mm -hmm. they don't, they don't make excuses. It's not even part of the program. Yeah. How many clients do you have Shelby? I don't, I don't keep um, Appro approximately a hundred, 200. It's up there. Yeah. 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 And how did you, I think people want to know this all the time. They, you know, the general population, the general industry want to know how do the coaches become coaches? So how did you become so good at what you do? Is it just time and expertise? Did you take courses? Is there, is there some way somebody out there who's watching can be like, I want to be like Shelby. How do I do it? I think the, A big part of it is being passionate about it, of course. Um, and that's passionate, not just for a week or a month or a year or two or three years, but five years, 10 years, 15 years. Um, and I mean, there's, it's just like bodybuilding. It's not always fun and it's not always easy. And there's going to be times, you know, that are, that are kind of shitty and you have a, a plateau or whatever, but you just, if you love it, you keep going and you keep doing it. Yeah. I, I think the main thing um, is just experience over the years. I don't, uh, I don't have uh, a college degree in anything related to bodybuilding. I, I have a, a bachelor's degree in psychology, which uh, doesn't, that didn't, that didn't teach me anything about coaching. Um, yeah. Coaching. I've just learned over the years. I was, you know, I was a bodybuilder myself. Um, I competed uh, for 13 consecutive years, um, so I was very, I was very in the trenches, uh, you know, in trying to learn as much about it as I can, as I could, and I, I think that gave me a, a good angle on it. But I mean, I've learned so much more just from coaching because coaching is everybody's different. There's yeah. I mean, and that's, that's really what I think allows me to get good results with my clients is try is figuring out each individual's recipe for success. Yeah. Um, like I, I'm, I'm okay with spending the time and doing the amount of updates needed and experimentation needed to figure out, oh, you do really good with this as opposed to this. Mm -hmm. um, like I don't, I mean, when, when you start off with a client, you just have to have sort of a best guess yeah. as to what they'll respond to. And then, you know, as, as you go and see the results, get feedback and stuff, you can say, okay, this is working. This is not working. Um, but after, you know, you might start off with a, a, a semi cookie cutter plan or a best yeah. guess. But yeah. as you get into it, as you get a couple of weeks into it, it's sort of like a choose your own adventure and you're doing, you know, each, each person is doing something completely different, different based on the response. Mm -hmm. So I think the, I think the thing that allows me to be good. And if someone's trying to be a coach, you know, if, if you're a, a newbie at this, you just have to inundate yourself with it and really get hands on and start working with people and, you know, engross yourself in it and, and study as much as you can, but you're not going to learn this stuff in books or courses or reading PubMed or any of that stuff. There's nothing wrong with that stuff, but don't fool yourself. 
Yeah. Don't fool yourself into thinking that that's going to teach you how to get someone to the Olympia stage or, or anything like that. It's, it's a nice adjunct, but the, the real work is done in the field coaching um, and just getting experience working with different body types and different mentalities, you know, mm -hmm. different psychologies and being willing to put in the, the work necessary to get the best out of each client. Yeah. I think there's a whole movement of people that came along, I don't know, I want to say 10 years ago, maybe, maybe more that were like the term bro science was invented and science. If you couldn't prove something with science, then it didn't exist. And I kind of tell people all the time that sometimes science can't explain some of the things that we do in the gym for whatever reason, but sometimes it's not explainable. So are you of the same mind or are you like, I asked Chad Nichols this question on, on when we did a podcast uh, last week. I said, how close is the science to the actual real world, um, the real world techniques that we use? How close are the two? What was his response? Chad said it, it, it touches on it, but it's not, it's not an overlap. Like it's not exact. Like there's things that it helped him learn how to, get started kind of but there was things that he had to learn on his own that was kind of the that was kind of the um the gist of what i got from what he was saying is there was things that he had to learn in the field kind of like what you're saying so i just well, want so my 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 response i guess would be i mean i i am a lover of science and mm -hmm. i i won't um i mean science is science is trying to figure shit out without having human bias yeah basically yeah. it's trying to understand reality and how things work without without human bias um and science is constantly improving and constantly figuring things out but science just there's a whole there's an there's an infinite array of things that science doesn't understand because we haven't gotten there yet i mean yeah. we're just starting we're just starting to scratch the surface of understanding how anything works at all yeah, <laughs> like yeah, yeah. human humans are very ignorant and so there's a lot of stuff that i mean if you just said i'm going to i'm going to only go by studies and only prop my clients using science you're not going to get very far yeah. like it just doesn't work that way there's yeah, there's yeah. too much subtle nuance and there's too much stuff that we don't understand to try to pigeon your pigeonhole yourself and say, I'm only going by what science is. And science doesn't account for all the different um, individual variability between people. Science yeah. is great. Science is great at coming up with averages, mm -hmm. um, but averages mask, averages mask uh, all, all the individual variability that you, that you have. Like I was just saying, you know, I start my clients off on a general plan and then a few weeks in, they're all doing something different. Yeah. Well, how do you explain that with science? Like what study are you going to look at? That's going to tell you that, you know, six people end up on six different plans. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, it, science isn't that we're, we're not at that level with science yet. I'm not saying that you can't, I'm not saying that there's not a scientific reason a, you know, a biological real reason for each of those variabilities but we don't have the science right now to say i'm just going to use science to guide yeah. my coaching you have to use um some intuition and experience mm -hmm. um to to make choices and and get people to the you know the best uh for their individual situation so this is kind of it kind of led me to my next question which i almost have the answer for i feel like every coach has a system Every coach kind of has a, I don't want to say that they coach people the same with a cookie cutter, but I feel like every coach has a system that they like that works for the bulk of their clients. Is there anything that you have, or is all six of those plans always going to be different? Or is there something that you kind of like to steer your clients towards? Is there, you know, like a, like a higher carb, lower protein or a higher protein, lower carb, more fats. Is there a type of system that Shelby uses? I, um, I mean, if I get a client, if I get a client that I know has poor, insulin sensitivity and has high body fat and has been bombarding their body with 
carbohydrate and they've been an inactive, you know, this is probably a non-competitor, but someone that's, you know, a typical overweight American, um, that's probably not someone that's going to get a high carb approach right out of the gate because they, I mean, their, their insulin sensitivity is poor. It's, that's not, I mean, I can just tell that's, that's not a good starting point for someone like that versus someone that comes to me and they're, um, have a lot of muscle mass, have a low body fat are doing great on, you know, 300 grams of carbs daily. And they're 140 pound female power lifter or whatever. I'm obviously not going to give that person a, a low carb approach. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I like giving people as much carbohydrate as I think they can handle. And usually over time, we're, we're able to increase that, um, you know, as, as their insulin sensitivity improves, uh, as their uh, metabolism improves, as they gain, gain muscle, and I learn more about their body, but I really don't. I don't really have like a, a, a basic plan other than I try to give them as much carb as they can handle initially. But, you know, there's, if I get an an Olympia. Well, I I guess what I was trying to say is if you get, I'm not saying, obviously if the spectrums are that far apart where you're talking about a competitor versus a regular guy on the street, I'm saying if you get four or five competitors and they all train pretty hard, they all have similar body types that come to you. Is there a system that you like to train your competitors under? And you answered it partially by saying you like to give them as many carbs as they can handle. So yeah. what I'm what I'm trying to do is walk through a diet with you because that's I kind of think my audience likes that. So I'm trying to kind of walk so, through a so diet. So just give me give 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 me the exact situation. Um, okay. Let's take a 200 pound male or 140 pound female. You can pick which one you want to go with. And they come to you and they say, you know what? I want to bulk up. They are about. 14% body fat, 13% body fat. And, um, they train, you know, once a day that are not doing any cardio and that's about it. That's your starting point. And they come to you and say, look, I want to, I want to put on muscle. I want to get to 220, or the girl says, I want to get to 150, whatever the situation. Um, where is, what does that diet look like to start? Is it high carb, high fat, low protein, high protein? Where, where's your starting point? Well, when I begin with a client, we'll just use female because I mean, that's yeah. mostly what I work with. So a sure. female that's 140 pounds and relatively lean, you know, not, not, not high body fat, but not contest shredded either. Yeah. Um, I mean, right out of the gate, you know, I, I ask for pictures, which is, you know, an obvious starting point, but I ask for a lot of information on what they've been doing up to now. You know, what is, what is their diet like? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, list out a full day of eating. What has your body weight been doing over the last couple of weeks? Has it been going up, going down, staying the same? Um, you know, if there's someone that's been eating only 200 grams of, uh, or only a hundred grams of carbs, yeah. um, and, and their body weights going up, then I'm probably not going to shoot them on a high carb plan because their body, I mean, if they're already going up, then I, they probably don't need much more. I might, I might configure the macros a little bit differently. Maybe a lot of people, in my opinion, under eat, under eat protein. I usually see people under eating protein more often than I do overeating protein. Okay. Can we touch uh, on, can we touch on that actually? Because I've seen what I've heard is people are doing the opposite. So what do you consider? For men, a- for men I think men probably do overeat protein. I think okay. most men probably do overeat, but women, women tend to undereat protein. What do you consider overeating protein? Just so we can let people know. For, what- for uh, two grams, two grams per pound. Two grams per pound is overeat. So what do you consider normal one or for good for ma- gaining mass? 1.5? For a male? Yeah. For, for a me. male? Yeah. Uh, 1.5 is probably okay. 1.5 is probably overshooting, but I think it's okay. That's yeah. what I did. That's what I did. Most of my competitive career was around 1.5, yeah. sometimes even a little bit higher. I would rather have someone overeat protein than under eat protein, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. some people just get stupid with it. You know, men, yeah. like young men, young men that are just getting into bodybuilding, oh, more protein is the better. The more protein you eat, the more muscle you gain. No. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, but w- women, women often undereat, and women often undereat in general, just calories, not what just a, protein. What does undereating protein for a woman look like? What is that? What? How many grams per pound is a woman taking in? I, I like women on at least uh, 1.1, 1.25 per pound. Um, you don't necessarily need to go much higher than that. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of times I'll see them at, you know, under, under a gram per pound. Um, and once you, once you get them eating more protein, their body starts shifting composition pretty rapidly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what is the, why is there such a, why is the disparity between women and men? Cause we're not talking about, we're not talking about the, the amount of protein per day. We're talking about a gram per pound. So why is a woman at 1.1 and a man at 1.5? Um, these are just, again, I don't use formulas like that. Okay. Um, and if I was working with a man right now, and I, again, I don't work with a ton of, a ton of males, I would probably start steering them more towards the 1.2. I think 1.25 is good for okay. anyone. Okay. Okay. I think 1.25 is good for anyone. From my own personal experience, I, I used to do about 1.5. I think 1.5 is okay, but I mean, you're, you're ingesting extra calories that have to get burned off for something. Yeah. So you, you probably don't need to be that high, but you know, of, of the macronutrients, protein is the least likely to be stored as, as body fat. Yeah. Um, where, where would, okay. Where is a good carb count for men and women? And I know obviously if somebody's heavy that you don't want their carbs that high and we'll get into insulin resistance and all that, but if somebody's not fat, and they come to you and they want to, you know, what is a good carb amount for a man or yeah, woman? I would, I would, I mean, I, I think a good moderate level for someone that's trying to lose body fat would be one gram per pound of body weight, like as a starting okay. point, okay. maybe a little bit, maybe a little bit lower, maybe yeah. 0.75 to one. Yeah. Um, and if, I mean, it depends on the psychology too. Sometimes you get someone that's like, I need to lose fat. I've got a wedding shoot coming up in eight weeks. Mm-hmm. You're going to be more aggressive because of the timeline. Yeah. Um, yeah. T- timeline. Timeline is always a huge factor. Uh, okay. You know, how, wh- when do you need to do it to accomplish this by now, if you're someone that has a good metabolism and you're relatively lean, you know, maybe, and you're trying to build muscle, you know, you're trying to, to add lean tissue, then, I think 1.5 to two grams is probably more of an, an an average starting point. Some people have crazy metabolisms and can handle way more than that. Yeah. And if you, if you know that right out of the gate, if they tell you right out of the gate, I'm eating 400 grams of carbs and maintaining my weight, then obviously you're going to, you know, push, push them towards a higher amount. But, you know, 1.5 to 2 is probably a, a, a decent starting point. So that's the question I have for you is let's say you're doing two grams per pound of body weight for carbs, right? And the person's not gaining any weight. Do you increase carbs? And how far do you increase carbs before you start increasing fats? Like where do fats fit into the equation for you? Um, I would definitely increase carbs first because, I mean, okay. fats, I just kind of keep – Fats, I kind of keep at a steady level, maybe, um, you know, 0.5 grams per pound of body weight, roughly. Yeah. Uh, may- maybe a little bit lower, maybe a little bit higher, but, you know, around half a gram. I would increase carbs first. Okay. I would I, I would keep increasing carbs until I got to a, probably over three or maybe even, it definitely over three before I started increasing fat. Mm-hmm. Um, I. I would only increase fat if they're like really having a, a hard time holding weight, you know, eating yeah. a ton of carbs. And then it would just be to give them, tr- maybe try to slow down the carb digestion a little bit and give them something else to give them something else to eat that they're not, people get sick of eating carbs. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, when they're on a high carb diet. So if you can give them more peanut butter or more avocado or whatever, that's, a little bit more palatable. They get something different, you know, it's yeah. fresh, it's different. So do you worry that adding the, okay. So clients run into that issue all the time. So do you worry that when you have somebody eating three grams per pound of carbs and, you know, a, a good amount of protein, and then you start increasing fat, do you ever worry that the fat is going to stop their 
is going to slow their appetite too much. Um, well, you, I mean, you're keeping, you're keeping a close eye on it, on yeah. everything. Like if it does, then you would make a change, you, pull back, you know, yeah. I mean, if, yeah, I mean, after they would know after a week and they'd be like, Hey, I'm, I'm missing meals or I can't get my food in. So we would, we would tweak something. Yeah. Yeah. Is there ever a point where you have fed somebody so much clean food that you're like, okay, we need to add in some junk. We need to add in some bagels or some whatever, yeah. whatever the junky, whatever the higher dense calorie food might be. Have you been there before? Yeah, definitely. There's people that get cheap meals, you know, on multiple days per week, sometimes, okay. sometimes five, six, seven days a week. Really? I, yeah, I have, I work with one client. Um, she's not a competitor. She's an older female. She's in her fifties mm -hmm. and she just has this crazy hummingbird of a metabolism. She's 130, she's 130 pounds, but she eats, I don't even remember the exact macros, but it's close to 600 grams of carbs a day. Wow. Which is, I mean, that's over four grams per yeah. pound of body weight. Yeah. Yeah. Her, her, her fats are at least 150 grams. So, I mean, that's, that's well over a gram yeah. and her proteins up there and she will still lose weight. Um, and so I have her doing a cheat meal, like at least, uh, five days a week. And I, I will give her a calorie count that she has to hit on her cheats. Otherwise she'll do some, something measly like a peanut yeah. butter jelly sandwich or something. Yeah. Yeah. Like, no, you've got to hit, you've got to hit 1500 calories or you've got to hit two, 2000 calories or, uh, I'm starting to slobber. I'm excited talking about this food. <laughs> do you think, um, do you think it's why wouldn't you, I mean, how can I ask this question? Is there denser foods that you can add to their everyday diet that would be better than adding cheat meals? Like for example, if like I had a client before, where I was like, okay, you know what? Let's start adding a Costco muffin to this meal or that meal because they're like 700 calories per muffin. Right. Is it, is it ever make more sense to just have a really calorie dense food that you're going to throw in on a daily basis? Or are you, you think it's better to go and have a couple burgers or a cheat meal or whatever you might call it? I I've, I've done it both ways. It just depends on the individual and what you think they're going to respond best to. If you've got someone that's already on 600 grams of carbs and they weigh 130 pounds yeah. I mean, I've been, I've been working with her for a few years and we've yeah. gradually worked up to where we're at now. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we've done a lot of things that have increased her calories, um, you know, over the weeks and months and years mm -hmm. and to get to where we're at now, um, you know, to her adding a 700 calorie, she's someone that needs a, a 2000 calorie boost every day yeah. on top of her regular diet. 700 calories is, I mean, you could add three muffins at 700 calories, I guess. But I mean, I, what's the difference? It's, I, I don't, when calories are that high, it's just about calories. Yeah. That's kind of what I was asking is what is the difference? Is there a difference or is it's, it's at that point because they're eating so much, there's just no difference. Just get when, it in. When, when, when calories are that high, I don't think it, it makes a difference. Okay. It, it's, it's whatever they're going to be able to get in. I mean, at that point, you're getting to the point of, they're sick of food. What can they get in? Yeah. Yeah. And be, and be consistent about and not quit. Yeah. And this where, okay. Throughout the day, where do you, are you a pre and post carb kind of person? Like where, how do you set up your, your macros throughout the day? Your protein says it stays constant. Yeah. And your fat I mean, stay I usually, pretty. I usually like five. I mean, most females get five or six meals. Proteins constant. I do like, I mean, if they're in the off season and trying to gain muscle, then I do push a little bit more carbohydrate, um, pre intra and, and mostly post, mm -hmm. mostly post. Um, but I mean, it, I, again, it, again, it depends on the, the individual and their metabolism. Um, yeah. I mean, if they're, if they're trying to lose body fat and they have terrible insulin sensitivity, I'm not going to, they, they might not get a ton of carbs around training. You yeah. know, it, it, it might be more evenly spread. But I, the, I do, I, I do like Perry. I do like Perry workout nutrition in the right, in the right circumstance. Where, what is the best way to reduce somebody's or increase somebody's insulin sensitivity? Cause that term comes up all the time lately. That seems to be very popular 
and not that it's a not that it's a gimmick or anything. I mean, it's real, but I noticed more and more people talk about it in the last couple of years than previous years. And people always want to know how do I get my insulin sensitivity back? Well, train training is a good way to increase insulin sensitivity. Training is uh, a great tool, and the other is just dieting, being mm-hmm. on a low calorie. I mean, if you have poor insulin sensitivity, which a lot of people do, if you have high higher body fat, you probably have poor insulin sensitivity. You've been eating. I mean, more chance. It's very likely that you've been overeating carbs for too long. Mm-hmm. So you have to go to under eating carbs for a while to get insulin sensitivity back. So the trick to get insulin sensitivity is to diet, to be on low carbs for a while. Now, mm-hmm. if you're someone with a, a, a great metabolism, you probably don't have to do that, or you don't have to do it for as long or as hard as someone that's born genetically, that's kind of on a, you know, a more endomorphic yeah. side um everyone's a little bit different but generally speaking weight training improves insulin sensitivity and lower carbs it will improve insulin sensitivity and over the years i mean if you diet and you stay consistent with this which is obviously the goal if you want success you get to a point where you can start eating more carbs and handling them better that's because yeah. you have improved insulin sensitivity and you've gained muscle um, all these things improve over time, but the, they improve over, over time on, on the matter of, you know, months and years, Mm -hmm. not on the matter of, you know, minutes and days. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I know that seems to be a common misconception in the industry is time of uh, time and ways to change your body. People think they can happen overnight and it can't, but what if somebody is working with you and, do you ever let your, you probably don't let your clients get out of control body fat wise at all. I mean, it, that would be, that would be a, um, a mistake. <laughs> that would, yeah. that, that, that would be, um, I mean, if I'm keeping a close eye on them, which, which means they're checking in with me, like as they should, then, then we're keeping, we're keeping control of that. Mm-hmm. If someone falls off the wagon and I don't hear from them for three months and they get too fat, you know, I mean, that happens sometimes. So um, what, when you're helping a client bulk in the off season, what is the, what's the most body fat somebody will have? And I know the percentages for women are going to be higher, but. Okay, I don't can... go by, I don't go by numbers. I never, I never measure body fat. Um, and honestly, I don't, a lot of times I don't even measure the macros. Yeah. Uh, I just go by a, a lot of times I just go by a meal plan. Yeah. That, I mean, what, the meal plan like initially starts off with a rough approximation of the macros, but over time we build and modify things. And, you know, two months later, if they, if they say, Hey, what are my macros? I might be like, I don't know. We've made so many tweaks, yeah. but it doesn't, it doesn't matter because it's working. Yeah. All that, yeah. all that matters is if it's working, you don't need to know the numbers. Knowing the numbers is it, 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 it just doesn't matter. What matters is, yeah. is it working or not? I guess my question, I guess my question is, what does it look like visually when somebody's too fat? Yeah, I just, I mean, I keep an eye on everybody stores their fat a little bit differently, but, um, you know, I mean, for generally speaking, you look at the midsection, the lower back and the hips, like if someone's starting to pile on a little bit too much there, then I would back off if they're, I mean, if they're gaining, if they gain five pounds in one week, they probably need to change something yeah. Un- unless it's, unless it's right after a show and it's all glycogen weight, yeah. unless it's that time of the month for a woman, you know, there's, there's variables that can cause fluid weight, but if you're consistently gaining five pounds a week, then you're eating too much, you know, for weeks, I've, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's something guys struggle with too. Cause they'll, they'll gain like a pound or two in a week. And like, I don't know why my weight's not going up. And I'm like, I don't know if it's that if it's good for it to go up any more than that. Like a couple right. pa- couple pounds a week to me is ideal. Yeah. So yeah. So if somebody does start getting fat, does that mean their insul- insulin sensitivity is off or not necessarily? Um, it's headed. I mean, insulin sensitivity is a spectrum. Yeah. It's, it's not like a yeah. on off switch. It's a spectrum. Yeah. But 
I mean, if you're if your body fat's starting to get heavier, I mean, if your body if your body fat's getting higher, your 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 body weight's getting heavier, your insulin sensitivity is probably on a gradual decline. Mm. Like after a show, after you've been dieting for a long time, you 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 have good insulin sensitivity, and initially you're in a good spot and you can eat you can eat carbs for a while and handle them well. But if you keep pushing it for too long, eventually you're gonna reach a point where your insulin sensitivity starts going down. Yeah, so, yeah. and usually, usually, usually carbohydrate reduction is the way to ameliorate that. Okay. So this is where it confuses me. And I don't know if it's different for women and men, but guys that put on the most size to me that I've seen in my career are the guys that bulk the hardest. And when I say bulk the hardest, I don't mean they get like fat, like, you know, like Lee Priest in that one off season where he was like super fat. I don't mean that but they do get pretty chubby and they end up putting on, you know, 10, 15 pounds of stage weight that year. Why is it good to get chubby if we're ruining our insulin sensitivity and how are those guys putting on so much muscle in the process? When I notice the guys that stay leaner don't necessarily put on the same amount of muscle mass. They actually put on less. So how do we, how does that, how is that explainable? Well, I don't, I don't think you're using the best science to come up with those observations. Okay. Um, I think, I think there are other factors involved. Mm-hmm. Um, the guy, the guys that are bulking up, I, there, there, there can be other factors involved. Are they, are they training harder? Are they getting stronger in the gym when mm-hmm. the guys that are staying leaner aren't necessarily getting stronger? Are they doing something different with their drugs? Are you, are you only seeing the ones that post success and not seeing the ones that say, Oh my God, I got too fat. Yeah. I'm not going to, I'm not going to post my progress pics. So no one hears about them. That's a good point. I mean, yeah. That's that, that's a survivorship bias. You mm-hmm. only see the winners. People yeah. only talk about their wins. Sure. People but, don't talk about their losses. But do you think, so is, are we, is what you're saying for the ones that you did say that are successful. So there are things that can overcome insulin resistance. Does that make sense? Um, if you're gassing hard on anabolics, sure. Okay. <laughs> that, that, so it wouldn't matter then. Well, I, I'm not going to say it doesn't matter, but I mean, ideally, I mean, to see the best progress, you're managing insulin sensitivity and you're gassing hard on it. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. you're gassing hard on anabolics. I mean, just, I mean, just being, uh, I mean, I mean, you've been a fan of this. Well, you've been part of the sport for a long time. I remember you from back in the forum days and that. So can you point to bodybuilders that have stayed lean that have put on a lot of mass? Cause I just have a lot of trouble with this thing. Cause I know everybody says the leaner you stay, the better your insulin sensitivity, the better your insulin sensitivity, the, the faster you can gain muscle, the more efficient your body will be. But I don't, well, I think as I think as bodybuilders, we have we have a skewed sense of what lean really is. That's true. Um, a lot of t- a lot of times, bodybuilders are very bloated in the off season and holding a lot of a lot of water water weight. Like if you look at off season pics of Jay Cutler and Ronnie Coleman back in the day, they were huge and bloated. But I mean, their body fat wasn't over. 12 percent if even that yeah. i mean yeah. they were still they were still vascular and lean they just looked like water balloons yeah I agree. and so someone some young some young male might look at that and be like oh look how huge and water they, watery they are i need to get huge and watery too to make gains but they end up they end up increasing their body fat without any anabolics in the mix and then they just end up a fat disaster okay, okay. um that makes sense. So but basically what you're saying is a natural guy or woman, obviously, shouldn't be bulking as hard as somebody who's on anabolics because they're not going to get the same benefits. Well, natural and also just genetics. I mean, if you're someone that's, you know, again, endomorphic, more, more prone to put on fat, you got to be careful even if you're on the sauce. That's, um, such, a, that's, I, such, a, that's such a tricky, sorry to interrupt you. I just feel like it's such a tricky term because I don't think people really know if they're endomorphic or not. I get so many people come to me and they're like, I'm really carb sensitive and I can't eat carbs. And I'm like, it, it can't be all of you. 
not all of you are are carb sensitive, right. right? You know what I mean? So I don't think people have the, an idea of how to really distinguish if they're endomorphic or if they're carb sensitive or if they're just eating like shit. Right. You know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, it's, it's, again, it's a spectrum. Um, yeah. I mean, if you're, I was, I was overweight in, uh, in elementary school, I was overweight. I lost uh, 30 pounds between elementary school and middle school, just yeah. on a diet of my own. I have a, I have a brother that's well over 300 pounds. Like it's definitely in my genetics to be fat. Sure. There's no, there's not really any gray area there. Like, yeah, like that, yeah, one's, yeah. that one I'm pretty confident about. And I mean, if, if you've been fat in your life and I don't mean just a little bit of skinny fat love handles, you know, whatever. But I mean, if you've been fat in your life and yeah. I, again, it's a spectrum, but I think people know what I'm talking about. You probably don't have the best insulin sensitivity that does again, it, again, it doesn't mean you can't improve it, but the drug thing, the drug thing's tricky. Like a lot of people assume that, Oh, once you go on drugs, you're just going to be a shredded beast. And you and I both, you and I both know that's yeah. bullshit. Yeah. There's tons of people. There's tons of people that run tons of drugs that don't even look like anything. Yeah. Um, and yeah. there's other people that are, that have better genetics and that pay m- meticulous attention to their diet and training and everything that look much better, even though they're natural. Yeah. Um, so drugs, drugs don't fix everything, but. Can I ask you if somebody comes to you, if somebody comes to you and they're overweight, like you said, and they, you drop their carbs and they, but they want to bulk. So you're like, I got to get your insulin sensitivity back first. Yeah. So if somebody, if so, if a, if a guy or, or a woman, they both they come to you and they say, look, I want to put on 10 pounds of muscle, but they're already overweight. You're going to take the first few months and get them lean first before you start going the other way. Yeah. Well, there's, there's two things there. One they do need to get leaner and improve their insulin sensitivity. Otherwise they're just adding more body fat or just the the ratio of body fat to muscle gain is not favorable. Um, And I explain that to them. And usually they say, okay, I I trust you. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm paying you a lot of money. So I trust you. You you have more, you have more experience with this than I do. Um, And two, most of those people can gain muscle while they're dieting. It's, it's maybe not super fast, yeah. but usually they're doing, usually they have a dicked up program. That's got a lot of holes in it yeah. that once, once they're eating a higher protein diet, once they're training consistently, once they're doing everything right, even though they're losing body fat, they're doing things that are increasing their muscle mass. So, mm. but yeah, a lot, but, but yeah, you do have to, I, I would definitely not take someone that's fat and say, yeah, let's keep bulking. Yeah. It's just an, an unfavorable ratio. Is, is when someone's leaner and they're gaining muscle more easily through food, is that strictly because of insulin sensitivity? Is there some other mechanism that allows them to, to absorb food better than somebody who's already got fat on them? Um, insulin sensitivity would be the, a key player I don't, I don't know. There's probably other players as well. I mean, there are just hundreds of hormones in the body that we're just beginning to understand. Yeah. Um, this, again, this is a thing where, you know, science, we only know so much. I mean, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. science is a very, it's a baby. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. We know, we know some stuff, but not, not everything. Where do, where do anabolics come into play and how much are people using too much? Some people are using too much. I mean, again, I only know the clients that I work with. Sometimes I get people, I, again, I'm, I'm working with females. Sometimes I'll get females that come to me and they're like, oh, my boyfriend put me on a cycle and he just cut every, he, I'm on the same cycle as my boyfriend, just taking half. I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> yeah. You knew that was coming. Yeah. <laughs> The, the 50% of my boyfriend's cycle. Yeah. <laughs> well, you're half my size, so you take half the right, stuff. <laughs> right, yeah. So I'm taking 500 milligrams of test a week and 200 milligrams of trend, you know. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, that's fucking funny. Um, it's so dangerous. Okay, so since you're specializing in women's 
I don't know if you, I don't know how far you want to get into this, but I think it would be very, one of the things I found, I found very challenging with my podcast is um, getting women to open up about this sort of thing. So I'm, I'm not sure if you can or not, but it would definitely probably help a lot of women if we could touch on this area and kind of get into what's too much, what's not allowed, what are compounds that are not beneficial for women to using, how far should women take their side effects? Like all these types of questions. Can we get into some of those things or? Yeah. Yeah. I'm fine with that. You know, with women, it's a, a lot of women, you kind of have like either the woman that's like scared of anything yeah, or the woman that's like, just turn me into, you know, yeah. uh, Ron, Ronnie Coleman. I don't give a fuck. Like, yeah. Yeah. And I mean, there, there are some in the middle, but a, a lot of times it's, it's kind of either or. Sure. Um, and it, it it obviously depends on your goals. You know, are you, are you going to compete? What, what division are you going to compete in? Um, can I, can I maybe break it down from what I see the most, the most prevalent thing I see amongst women, it could, it could just be the circle I'm in or the people that message me, but the most prevalent thing I see are women that want to be in shape. They want to look good. They don't want to be Ronnie Coleman. They still want to keep their femininity. Um, but they want to get in shape because they're having a tough time. They can't lose the body fat. They, they want to look like a little bit more tone, whatever you want to call it. So I guess to be more specific, what are some compounds that women, women should just not touch in that, in that genre of women that are just like trying to look better, but not necessarily sure. be, uh, on the Olympia stage. Sure. So stuff, stuff not to touch. I mean, if you're, I, again, if you're, if you're not going to step on stage, it's, I, w- I would think long and hard about using any, anything for anyone. This, you know, this is for a male or for a female. I would spend, I would spend a while thinking about it because I think a lot of people rush into it. Um, you know, they, they, they think about it for, and, and then they, they research for all of two or three days and then they know exactly what, everything you know they're like oh i know everything i did my research because they did they did a couple google searches and and talked to one person that competed in the 80s um but i mean really really spend time researching this stuff and make sure that it's a road that you want to go down because it's it's not a road that you can easily uh once you've gone down it you've gone down it and there are there are not just health risks. There are also, depending on your country, there's legal risks. Mm-hmm. So um, this is all, you know, th- these are all things to take into consideration. And a lot of people say, if a lot of people will say, if you're not going to compete, then you shouldn't dabble. Okay. I think that's, I think that's a judgment call that's not mine to make. I mean, what, what, what about competing makes you suddenly okay to, devil and drugs yeah. and if you're not i mean if you want to if you want to enhance your body and you've dec- you've spent the time thinking about it um and, and you want to do it and you're not going to compete then go f- yeah that's that's your call that's not for for uh anyone else's choice or whatever mm-hmm. um but i mean the, the the very beginner anabolic that it always gets thrown out is is anavar for females um, and that's that. That would be my general recommendation for a starting point. It's not an injectable. You don't have to bother with needles. Yeah. Uh, it's an oral. It's a pill. You can start at a low dose. You know, start at you know five milligrams or ten milligrams a day, and sure. you can and you can see how am I responding to this? Do you know? Do, am I getting? Am I getting uh, negative side effects? How do I feel about those side effects? Is this something that I want to continue? Can I handle it? Um, so a- Anavar would be the first suggestion for an anabolic. Yeah, um, yeah. And for some people, that's enough. They get, you know, the gains that they, they seek from that. They get the, the body composition change. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I would always start there. And then, you know, depending on, depending on how far you want to go with it, then you could look at adding, adding in other things. What? Uh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Well, if you're pre-contest and you're getting ready for a show, I mean, most of the women in the muscular divisions are using Anavar. 
Yeah. Some people, some people might like another oral better, like Tarina Ball. Um, yeah. But An- Anavar is probably you know ninety percent of of uh, competitors in those divisions. You know, figure women's figure, et cetera. At what point? At what point are women using GH? Are any? Because I've heard of I've heard of just regular. I don't want to call them regular women, but non-competitive women but they still want to be in shape and still want to lose body fat using like an IU a day, like one IU a day. Is that, is that a common thing? Is that a recommended? Is it, is it horrible? It's, like it's, it's fairly common, especially, especially cause you can get it from an HRT clinic. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can get medically prescribed GH for, uh, you know, longevity. Uh, it, it, obviously it has some cosmetic effects as well. Fat loss, skin, hair, nails, that, that kind of stuff. Um, I don't, I don't see, I, I, I think a, a low dose of GH is fine. You know, um, I, it's not something that I would be like, oh my God, what are you doing? The I stuff feel- you, you, you asked about what you, I, I didn't answer the question. You asked what are, what are the things that women definitely should not take? Before we move on to that though, I just want to ask you, I've always felt like, and I haven't put anybody on GH, but if I was going to. I feel like any women, sorry. I feel like if I was going to, it might be one of the safer things to, to use as a woman. Would that be right I or agree. wrong? Yeah, I agree. I right? agree. Cause I don't yeah. feel like, I don't feel like one IU is going to give them uh, some of the nasty side effects that they would get from say testosterone or something like that, but it's, it is going to give them the fat loss benefits that they want. Yeah. Yeah. GH is pretty. Yeah. I don't, I don't see any negative side effects from a, uh, you know, a nice, uh, moderate dose of gh yeah so yeah going back to the question what what are things that you've seen that are crazy or compounds that you've seen are like reserved for maybe the highest levels of competition and and these you know bikini girls are using things that are just crazy where where are we there um i i you know women do use testosterone in low amounts for hormone replacement therapy so i don't I'm not looking to, to demonize testosterone, but doing large amounts of testosterone is usually a recipe for disaster with females. Um, and I don't usually see it unless you're talking about a very high level female bodybuilder. Yeah. And I'm talking about bodybuilding, not, not women's physique or figure or anything like that. Yeah. A lot of times I see women's bodybuilders that don't even use testosterone just they, they're able to have that size without it mm-hmm. um but some you know choose to do to, to get to that level of size but th- these these are women that are on stage at you know 100 160 170 pounds yeah. um they're, yeah. they're basically middleweight men um you know but i hear about women doing trend and it sounds insane to me is it insane or is this because i'm out of touch um i I, I'm in the same boat as you. I, 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 I think trend is a little bit going nuts, but female bodybuilders, it's a fairly common one. Again, we're talking about the but most, I, yeah. we're talking about the most muscular division for women. Yeah. Um, but trend for anything less than women's physique, I would say, I, I don't even, I wouldn't even recommend it for women's physique. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, though some, some women's physique competitors use it, mm-hmm. um, it would not be my, uh, it would not be my recommendation. Yeah. I have to, I have to preface my, my questions with these aren't, I'm not talking about professional women's physique or even high level women's physique or women's bodybuilding. I'm talking about, I hear about bikini girls with some of these stacks and I'm like, this is insane to me. Like you're if not, I, I mean, for bikini, for bikini, it, for bikini, I think, you know, Anavar, Clenbuterol as a fat burner, um, maybe Tamoxifen, Novadex mm-hmm. for estrogen control, maybe T3 for thyroid if, if it's needed. Um, now, before you go on, I thought T3 was very dangerous for women to use because I thought, isn't it, it's, isn't it like you could shut down their thyroid? to their own personal thyroid, right? Like, is that true or not true? Not true. Uh, not true. I mean, if you go nuts with it, 
Yeah. That's I mean, it, same thing for a man, right? Yeah. 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 So what's a, what would a proper dose for a woman be of T3? Like there is no proper dose. You only use T3 if your thyroid's getting slowed down and you need a boost. Okay. Um, some women don't need T3 at all. But I mean, there has to be a, there has to be a, a max dose of some sort. Like, I mean, there a isn't, there, there, there isn't, but like an ideal, like I, like personally, I don't go over 50. Like, yeah, 50, I mean, 50 for a woman would, it would be the same. I mean, okay. 50 is a nice, but some women need to go higher. Yeah. 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 Okay. I mean, wh when I used T3, when I was competing, um, I would start at 25 and slowly increase based on, pro uh, based on need. Yeah. You don't just like, sometimes I see T3 cycles that are written out on paper and it's like, that's stupid. You have no idea if you need that much T3. T3 is yeah. just to regulate your metabolism. Yeah. And that yeah. can, there's no need to increase T3 if it's not needed. There's no need to even use T3 if it's not needed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But if it's needed, you know, some people might be fine staying at 50. Other people might need to go to 75 or maybe even 100. I've, I've been up to some, some preps. I would work up to about a hundred at the end. I think there was uh, one, I think there was one like early on in my career, I, I got up to a hundred, but I found that I, I eventually I found out that I only need, like I could get away with 50. It was the most I needed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what about psychological effects? Uh, you know, I, obviously women are going to have a tougher time with some of these things than men. Do you run into that a lot? Do you run into women who have come to you from using cycles that, like you said, their boyfriend put them on a cycle and now they have facial hair or they have some other side effect that they can't deal with or they're having trouble dealing with? Do you run into that a lot or are most women pretty happy with their decision? Um, most women are pretty happy with their decision. I don't usually run into people that have any huge regrets or anything like that. But that's, again, you're, you're getting into... Again, you're getting into a selection bias. If, if this is someone that's contacting me and wanting to work with me, it's I'm not going to get people that are like, oh my God, I'm done with steroids. I don't want to do it again. I only get people that want to get better and yeah. want to and want to climb the ladder. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not hearing from those people. Okay. I, you know. So out of the people that you do work with, though, they're all fairly confident and happy and consistent with what they're doing. They're oh yeah. Like, they love what they're doing. And it's always, there's no. That's, and that's at every level from, you know, novice or even non-competitor up to Olympia bodybuilder or whatever. They're all, they're all cool with their choice. Because they... I'm, I'm just thinking of the women that are scared, right? They want it. Like we're talking about the women that are on that borderline where they want to look better. And they're like, you know, I heard my friend did this. I heard my friend did that how do we like, how do you quell their fears when they're, or those people aren't coming to you at all? Well, I do. I do sometimes get people like that. And I just, I tell them don't mess with it. Like yeah. it, it's, it's probably not worth it. Like, it sounds like, I mean, if you're that, if you're that, um, you know, scared or, or questioning it, mm -hmm. it's probably not worth it. Or if, if you're going to try it, just try an extremely low dose, maybe try SARMs, maybe try SARMs first and see how you feel about the results and any potential side effects from that. And then if you like the SARMs, then maybe graduate to a very low dose of Anivar. Mm -hmm. You know, take it just baby steps. But I never, I, I would never want to be like, oh my God, you need to do this. <laughs> I, I, I'm always, if anything, I want to err on the other side. I want to err on the side of Let's not do that and see mm -hmm. how things go. Mm -hmm. Let's see how you do without it for a while. And then if you still want to do it, you know, three months from now or something, then we can talk about it. Um, where does insulin fit into the equation? Because I know you like, like you said, you like the peri-workout idea and you like a lot of carbs. I've never, and... used, I've never used insulin with a female. That's okay. not to say, um, that's not to say that that's a good idea. Yeah. Um or a bad idea. I just have never done it. I've never seen the need to, but sometimes I, I think it might be a benefit. You know, if, if you get people that are really pushing, um, you know, I should take that back. I, this year I do have a couple 
females using insulin, but it's because they just, they have extremely high carb intakes. Yeah. Well, well over, well over three grams per pound of body weight. They have, they have, a, they have problems holding it. And insulin is just taking a, a, it's giving your pancreas a break and allowing you to shuttle nutrients a little bit better. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are scared shitless of insulin and think it's, you know, I mean, insulin, if used incorrectly, can definitely be dangerous. But if if you know what you're doing, if you're not an idiot, um, it's, it's, I mean, it's a, a natural hormone, you know. I'm, I'm one of those people that hates insulin. I'm not serif. I'm not scared of it, but I, I don't like but it could be could be just the improper use. Even though I've tried, I've tried many different ways. For some reason, it it all it does is tend to make me fat. So I used it. I used it in probably every fashion that is possible yeah. when I was when I was competing. Yeah. Um, and I don't think I really got any benefit from it. It probably just made me fat. Yeah, um, that's what I thought. <laughs> well, you have you have to be careful with insulin, though. You have to you have to pair the insulin dose to the carb amount instead of vice versa. Yeah. A lot of people will, a lot of people will increase their carbs because they're taking insulin. Yep. And then they, and then they blame the insulin and it's, yeah, like, but, well, if, you, but if I'm, this is the way the thought process works for most guys, because this is how I used to think about it when I was purely a meathead, I still am purely a meathead, but I would, um, I'd be like, you know what? I want to get in more calories because I want to get bigger. So I'm going to try and slam, you know, 200 grams of carbs post-workout or 150 grams of carbs post-workout. So that's why I would add the insulin. I'm like, okay, let me add insulin to that. Let me get the 10 grit, 10 I use of insulin in so I can slam the 150 grams of carbs and it'll go to where it's supposed to go. And what I found was I felt great for a week and then I just got fat after that. Right. So. But if you, if you did that exact same thing, but you weren't taking the insulin shots, what do you think would have happened? I still would have got fat. Exactly. Yeah, but, <laughs> so, so how, can you, how can you how can you blame the insulin? How can you blame because, the insulin? Because my point is, it's supposed to help you not get fat, but it makes you fat. But it's just right. Because. I I think correct correct me if I'm wrong. You're someone that has the ability to gain body fat if you're not if you're not tight on your diet. You've uh, no, I'm actually my metabolism is pretty good. I think I'm not I'm not really an endo. I, I, if anything, I think I'm an okay. act, if anything, I think I'm more of a Ecto mezzo. Have you always been like that? Pretty much, yeah. Because you know, like I was, like I said, Chad was just on the podcast. And we were talking about how fast I used to get lean. Okay. I I really don't have trouble. Like I have to eat a lot to get fat. Okay. So uh, I've been pretty good that way. But I just noticed that, and you're probably right. You know, that's a good that's a good point you made. That that hundred grams of carbs post workout or 150 grams of carbs that would have made me fat anyway. But I think that's the the common consensus with guys is, well, this is going to make me fat, but if I take the insulin, then it'll drive the carbs to the muscle and I won't get fat. Right. You still have to pay attention to calories and everything. Yeah. Um, I, that's yeah. why I think people think it's magic. That's, right. Right. Exactly. Like, like all of a sudden I can eat 500 more grams of carbs magically and it's not going to do anything to me. Right. It's all, it's just going to turn into muscle. The more <laughs> I eat, the more muscle I gain. <laughs> Right. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that's, that's actually what I used to think. <laughs> right. I know. I know. I've been there. <laughs> so, okay. No. So what you're saying is if somebody's eating 75 grams of carbs post-workout, they shouldn't add more carbs to it. They should just take the insulin for that 75 grams. Right. Yeah. Try four IUs and see yeah. what happens. Yeah. yeah. So you're yeah. just saying, you're saying don't increase your food. Just let the insulin make your body more efficient. Right. Okay. If, okay. if if you if you want to try it, yes. Yeah, don't, yeah. Don't make, don't don't make any diet changes. Just add an insulin based on your current intake. Now, do you think? You know you do. So one of the things I noticed was, I would become very, and this this is probably the wrong language to use, but I felt very insulin resistant after about a week or two using insulin. It became to the point where, like, you know, that first week when you start using insulin you get really puffy, you're really swollen, you have great pumps. After a week, that would start to dip away. And after two weeks, I'm like, okay, now I'm just sweating and I'm, I'm getting fatter and nothing's yeah. happening. So were you, how, how many days a week were you doing it? I've tried all different scenarios. I've tried scenarios where I'm doing it on weak body part days only, like a couple times a week. I've tried it where I was doing it on training days. So like five times a week. Um, the five times a week thing is definitely the worst. 
It was just not not yeah, beneficial. I think uh, uh, in something I know. I mean, it, it, this I've never talked to Chad personally, but I've I've you know heard of his protocols through the years and stuff, yeah. and I I know he you know through the grapevine used to like having one higher carb day a week where you would push insulin more more doses have you know yeah. have have a, a higher carb day a week and maybe maybe he used insulin on the other days too i don't know no, I, I don't, maybe, maybe you worked up to that i'm sure it's individual as well yeah i don't i don't think chad would mind me saying i think there was two we used to do two days a week and they were usually my off days uh -huh. and, and those off days he would try and basically refuel me for the next set of training days with right. those with those off days and those were the days i would do the insulin like i said it seemed to work but not like i thought it would and it, and, it, and it did make me fatter and i almost feel like it maybe it did blow up my stomach because of how much food i had to eat right with, with the insulin right so uh i just I never just never been a fan but i've also never tried it the way you're saying to try it where i don't really increase the food i just add it for help right yeah. I mean, if you do, you know who Colette Nelson is? Yeah. She is uh, an insulin aficionado. That's what she does for a living. She does uh, like she, she um, or or she used to. She worked for a medical company, and she would go and do talks at like corporations and stuff about um, using uh, you know blood sugar dynamic drugs and everything. And she knows all the million time types yeah. of, you know, uh, insulin and different oral, oral insulin and all these different things. Mm -hmm. And she's a fan of it just for, for health benefits yeah. for a bodybuilder because bodybuilders generally eat higher carbohydrate diets. And her idea is take, take a, take the stress off of your pancreas, um, by using a little bit of supplemental insulin. So let me ask you this, if that's, if we're saying it for that reason, right? Like, I know if we're saying it for muscle gain reasons, we're probably going to use um, a Humalog because it's fast acting. Might use it post workout, right? But I always, I always think of the idea of using Lantus, which is like the twenty four hour. That's but it's not. What, that's what she liked. That's yeah. what she liked. Last last time I heard, I don't want to yeah. put any. I think uh, there's been some new ones come out since since Lantus, but. I yeah. guess what I guess what I'm asking is, have you ever experimented with that either yourself or on anybody? We're using. I have never used the the really long. I, I used Humulin R, but not Lantus. Not the long acting one. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, when it comes to training, how are how is women's training different than men's, or is it not? I don't think it should be. Um, I mean, if you're training for bikini or wellness, then obviously you're, you know, wellness. You're you don't one as big of an upper body as a lower body. So you're probably training upper body less frequently. You're training lower body more frequently. Mm -hmm. But other than that, I don't think they're, I mean, the, 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 the most successful women I see, and I'm talking about the very muscular divisions, uh, yeah. women's physique, women's physique and bodybuilding are the women that train with guys and just try to get strong as fuck. Yeah. I've seen that even in figure though. Yeah. Figure, figure too. Yeah. I don't, I don't work yeah. with as many figure competitors as I do women's physique and, and, um, and, and bodybuilding, but figure would be the same. I mean, figure nowadays is almost like women's physique. They're so muscular and, and lean. It's there's, there's not a big gap between those, but yeah, in any division where you want to gain a lot of muscle or even, even if you're not a competitor and you just want to gain muscle, just get strong. Like, do you ever find, sorry, sorry to interrupt you again. Do you ever find that women that come to you that aren't competitor? I know you said most of the people that come to you are competitors, but if they're not, do you find that they're, they shy away from some of the power movements like a squat or a deadlift or something, even though that might help their lower bodies? I mean, you know, women are always they're trying to build their glutes, but they won't, a lot of them don't want to squat. And I'm like, kind of, you're missing the, the best exercise yeah. possible. Right. I don't get too many like that. Um, yeah. They've already kind of got, got it figured out by the time they get to you. Right. Okay. I see. So what, but can you give advice to the women? Cause there's a lot of women that surprisingly, I don't know why, but there's a lot of women that watch this podcast <clears throat> that are kind of starting out. So 
would you say the isolation moves are more important than the compound movements? I mean, you need both obviously, but should they be avoiding the compound? Should they be avoiding? People always ask me like, what, what leg exercise should I do? What, you know, what, what's the best exercise for my glute hand tie in? Yeah. What's the best exercise for my hamstrings and glutes or, or my, my lower body? That's a question that I just constantly get is what's the best exercise for this? And I always say, do all the same shit that everyone else does and get brutally strong on all of it. Really? Um, and that's, that's compounds, that's isolations. I mean, if you, if you, if you, if you only do one exercise in the gym, then it makes more sense to just focus on the compound movements. But yeah. nobody's doing nobody's doing just one exercise. Yeah, that's yeah. that's another silly question that you get. What yeah. one exercise should I do for back? And it's like no one does just one exercise. Yeah, well, I'm not I'm not asking what one question. I'm asking. I I want I'm always trying to convince women that the compound movements are very important. Oh, they're, yeah, definitely. They're but, the most bang for your buck movement. Yeah. I, I mean, otherwise, I mean, if you you've got an hour to train and you want to make the most progress progress possible. You want to change your physique the most in the next three months or six months or whatever. Don't do the stupid yeah. booty work, bikini bullshit, get strong on the basics. Cause that will accelerate your progress much, much faster than any step down on the pull-up machine or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Because the main, um, the main fear I get from, everyday women is I don't want to be bulky. I don't want my legs to be really thick and bulky. And I'm, I'm like, that's going to take years for that to happen. It's not going to happen just from squatting like a few times a week. You know what I mean? Like it's probably, it's probably not even going to happen. <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's, true. <laughs> that's true too. Yeah. Um, I mean, unless, unless they're accidentally on, you know, half of their boyfriend cycle or yeah, whatever, that, it's that, probably just not going to happen. Yeah, that's and true. The, the, the compound the compound movements also burn more calories. So yes. I mean if you're looking if you're looking for body composition shift and you know body fat reduction, then that's that's where your, your effort should be. Um I mean the the only time you wouldn't want to do that is if you just wanted to look emaciated. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. It, and, and and maybe that's some women's goal, but usually women that are hiring me and you and listening to this potty ca- podcast, yeah, I think they want to look more like you know the CrossFit competitors or yeah. something like that. Yeah, um, and that's why, and that's why, like I, I I always tell people, you know, you should follow, you know, some of the you know the figure girls that have their booty workouts out there and stuff. But even while doing that stuff, you have to do the compound movements because that's what's going to build it the most. Right. And a, a lot of times, um, a lot of times th- these women will have these booty workouts or whatever. And it's like, well, that's not what built the muscle for them. That's not what built their physique. That's that may, that's maybe what they're doing now, yeah. but that's not what they did in the beginning that built, you know, 85% of their physique. Yeah. So Shelby, why did you, uh, just, I want to get a little bit of history on you before we go. Why did you stop competing? Cause you had a pretty good physique. So I don't know what, what you just decided it wasn't for you anymore. I, well, I competed for 13 consecutive years, um, 13 is, years without a break. Is that and, you? That's, that's you, right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's a I nice, was, I was okay. I wasn't anything special. Um, and I was, I was getting older, uh, and I, my placings weren't necessarily getting any, my, my placings weren't getting better. My placings were getting lower. The highest I had was one, one pro show. I made the first call out and I got um, fourth place uh, at Chicago pro. But after that, I just wasn't doing well. I was trying to lower the gear and trying to see if I could be successful on lower doses. And uh, that wasn't, uh, it didn't work. Really success, <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> that didn't really work out for me. <laughs> Yeah, that's just, it, just, it just I just decided, hey, I'm I'm going to be 40 next year. You know, I think I think this is it. I'll focus on on something else. So, you know, I I I hate you know, I I laugh at what you when you said that. 
but I hate that inevitably somebody will hear that and go, oh, see, it is the gear. He tried to lower the gear and he didn't, it didn't work. And well, I'll, I'll tell you one thing. I'll tell you yeah. one thing. I start the year that I got fourth. I made first call out at Chicago Pro. Yeah. I ended up in fourth. That was my highest pro placing. That year I did start reducing um, the supplements, but not, not drastically, maybe yeah. on the order of, maybe on the order of 10 or uh, 20% reductions. Yeah. And then I was like, oh, I got fourth on reduction. So the next year I was like, I'll reduce it by 50%. <laughs> this doesn't kind of work. <laughs> doesn't work. Doesn't work that way, guys. No, it doesn't work that way. You need, so the, the moral of the story is it does play a part. We just don't know. We don't know exactly. Oh, come on, come on. Of course yeah. it plays a role. Yeah. I mean, oh, and I, and I always tell people that I'm not, I don't bullshit anybody on the podcast. They, I always say it's part of the puzzle. Yeah, and I'm not saying I'm not saying that more is better, but the appropriate amount is the appropriate amount is is what's needed if you're going to play with the big boys, you know. Yeah, and I, mean, I, I was I wasn't even a big boy, so I don't know. Yeah, I don't think more is better, but I do think that it, answer. Let me know if you think this is true. Does your body adapt to a certain amount, and then if you go lower than that, your body won't respond the same way? Because that's what I've noticed is because I there was a few years where I did a lot. And like more than I should have. And I recognized that it was more than I should have. So I scaled back, but I could only scale back so far before I started to notice that I wasn't getting as much out of it. Whereas other guys that never did as much didn't have to go as high as I did. Does that make sense? I think, I think that just has more to do with individual variability than, than necessarily going up and then coming down. I don't, I don't think that necessarily. So like, before uh, I so you're talking about like a hyper response, like the way people respond to the drugs and clear the drugs from their bodies. Yeah. Like that. yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Cause I'm like, I always wonder sometimes why some guys can do like 750 milligrams a week and some guys got to do 1500 milligrams a week. And then, but obviously, right. I mean, that, that that's going to play a big part in it. Right. Yeah. So, but I wonder had I not ever gone to 15, would I be good at a thousand? That's what kind of my, my always, I always have that question in my mind. Right. Yeah. So and it, it's it's hard to answer that because we don't have controlled scientific studies with tons of people, you know. All we yeah. have is is your individual yeah, yeah, you know, n equals one. Yeah. So what um before you go, what's next? Is there do you have women that are at the Olympia level or at the obviously you have women at the pro level? I had five women at the Olympia this year. I had six really? that were I had six that were qualified and one wasn't able to make it because of uh, COVID. Who did you have? Who did you have at the Olympia? They're all bodybuilders or their physique or figure? Or... Uh, I had three, three in bodybuilding and two in physique. Okay. Yeah. How, and how'd they make out? Uh, Hella Trevino was third. Asha Hadley, this was her first year doing women's bodybuilding up from women's physique. She got seventh. Oh, good for you, man. Uh, yeah. Uh, and, and then a couple of gals in women's physique got seventh and ninth. Okay. Um, okay, man, I'm going to wrap up. Is there anything you want to say or anybody you want to thank or anything you want to promote before, or any kind of message you want to tell people that they're doing something all wrong and you want to help them <laughs> before we go? <laughs> um, not really. I mean, I don't really, I don't have any self-promotion or anything. Uh, I, I would just say um, I'm kind of put, the, the, big, the, 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 the biggest message is just understand that uh, there are a lot of moving parts and that there's a lot in bodybuilding. There are a lot of moving parts, a lot of different things uh, playing a role in your progress or lack of progress. And there is a ton of uh, individual variability. So be be careful about be careful about comparing yourself to others you know comparisons comparisons are helpful uh so comparisons are helpful when they're helpful and they're they're not helpful when they're not i mean if you're you, you can use them to maybe get a, a gauge or idea of of what what you should be doing or how you should be progressing mm -hmm. but there is so much individual variability you have to be very careful with comparisons because they can bite you in the butt um yeah. So definitely, definitely com compete with yourself first and foremost. Um, and just try to be a little bit better than you were 
yesterday. If, if you do that consistently and keep adding up good days and weeks and months, I think you'll uh, be astonished with the progress you can make. Yeah, I think that's a good message. Um, okay, Shelby, thanks for the hour, man. I appreciate the time. My and, pleasure. Uh, maybe we'll do it again soon. All right. All right, brother. Thank you. Take care. Thanks. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, share with your friends, and like the video. And if you get a chance, check out the description for all the different links to all the different places you can find Hostile and myself. And lastly, check out Hostile.com for our new line of supplements and all of our apparel and gear. Thanks again for watching.